Well, when I learned you were doing a, a series called Hope Explored, and I thoroughly recommend that uh, course to you. I think it's only three sessions, uh, isn't it? And uh, chance to uh, interact. You can stay silent and say nothing, or you can ask questions. But it takes you through, I think it's the Gospel of Luke, in uh, three, three big chunks about the life of Christ, his death and his resurrection. The one who said, I am the way, the truth and the life. So you're doing Hope Explored. I thought I'd look at two aspects of hope. Uh, one is the future hope that we'll look at this morning. Uh, the Christian has a real hope. And uh, the hope that a Christian has isn't a vague, wishy-washy hope. Oh, well, I, I hope so. Uh, for many years, I've been a, a fan of Burnley Football Club. I was brought up here, near Burnley in uh, Lancashire, Yorkshire Borders area. And uh, this season, it's looking pretty grim. But I have a hope they'll get out of the hole that they really are in at the moment and losing to a lower division team yesterday in the FA Cup. Things don't look too good, but I have a hope. It's a pretty vague one. It might not happen. I went to bed last night hoping the English cricket team would hang on for a draw uh, in Australia. And I woke up this morning and it's eight wickets down and ten overs left and uh, fiery boulders coming in with a new ball. But my hope was realised and they hung on with nine wickets down and uh, got a, a commendable draw. We were rejoicing over a draw uh, this morning. But hope, a worldly hope, can fail but the hope that the Christian has is a sure hope it's a certain hope it's a definite hope and we have a real real hope in this very difficult world of uh, I mean there's uh, such great events taking place um, global warming climate change how do we tackle that well we hope we can uh, there's a global pandemic. Have you heard about that? Um, it's gripped us for nearly two years now. Is there a way through? Well, we, we hope that there is. And what, what is the answer to the great needs of the world and your needs individually? I mean, I, I don't know many of you here. Uh, I think Nigel's gone downstairs to check, check on the lunch. Is it? Yeah, he's done that. I've known Nigel and I've known her for more years than I, I care to remember. Certainly well over 30 uh, years. And is that little Anna there as well? Goodness <laughs> me. And uh, then I, I've known Mark for quite a few years. He used to be my young, young assistant in St. Melons. And uh, here he is now, a grown-up man. And his wife and, and children as well. But for most of you, I don't know you uh, at all but behind your faces are stories I don't want to belittle them there are good times difficult times and what, what's your hope do you have a real steadfast sure hope I mean the hymns we were singing were written by men and women who believed those truths and for many years I didn't believe the Bible I was an atheist at the age of 19 doing my degree in chemistry it was a big shock when I was converted and to come to know God and to have this certainty of heaven uh, to come. And that's the Christian hope, that there is a heaven, there is a great reality to come. Do you believe in heaven? In a recent survey, 90% of people in America believe that there is a heaven. Uh, when that same survey was done in Denmark, only 18% believed that there was a heaven. In Britain, we're right in the middle. 50% believe that there is a heaven. So I want to speak about that this morning. The, the hope for the future. Future hope. Uh, heaven. Three little questions I want to answer. Where is it? Where is it? Secondly, we'll spend most time on this. What is it like? But then most vitally and importantly at the end, so hang on to your hats for this one. How do I know I'm going there? How do I get there? Don't ask... Uh, Siri and don't ask Alexa, they haven't got a clue. But uh, the Bible gives the answer. So, three things. Where is heaven? What is it like? How do I get there? Where is heaven then, first of all? 
In the early 1960s, a Russian man was blasted into space. He was the first astronaut. He was called Yuri Gagarin. Well, cosmonauts, they call them in, in Russia. And he went up and he circled the Earth once and he came back down successfully. And he got out of his capsule and he said, I've been to heaven and there is no God. So, well, I've looked up there. Where is heaven? Is it going up and up? We tend to feel that heaven is up, but it's not up. It's not up. Where is heaven? A lady called Belinda Carlisle sang a song in the 1980s, I think it was. Uh, heaven is a place on earth. Well, is it? I, I don't see any heaven uh, around here. Uh, heaven is what you make, they say. They can, oh, hell is a, a place on earth and heaven's a place on earth. Well, that's not the truth either. Where exactly is heaven? A man called John Lennon, uh, he wrote a song and sang, uh, Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine there's no heaven. But you know, if I'm honest, even when I was an atheist, believing there was no God, I couldn't quite believe that when you died, that was the end. Being honest, even in my days of atheism, Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. I don't think it is that easy. Deep down we know there is more to life than this. We feel we're made for better things than this. We, we feel we deserve better things than this. Well, where is heaven? Well, let me answer from the Bible. Heaven is the immediate presence of God. Wherever he is in his unrestrained glory, that is heaven. And heaven, we'll look uh, in Revelation chapter 21, there's a time coming when God will say, now the dwelling place of God is with man. God is going to pull back the curtain and say, ta-da! A trumpet's going to sound, we're told. An archangel's going to shout, and the curtain's going to be drawn back. And uh, we'll see not only the effects of God, planets and stars and the sun and the trees and the rivers and the valleys and the mountains and the lakes and the food and the joy and the families. We're going to see God himself. Now you need to be ready for that time. In the earth's history, there have been times when God has just pulled back the curtain a little bit and we've had a glimpse of heaven. It happened at Christmas time, 2,000 years ago. There were some shepherds on a hillside and something of heaven pushed in. Some angels appeared and the glory of the Lord shone around and about. The shepherds were terrified. But the angels said, fear not, I've got some good news. A saviour is going to come into the world. Oh, where is heaven? Well, it's not up, it's not down. It's wherever God is in his unrestrained presence. So that's where. Now we'll move on to what. What is heaven like? When we get there, when we all get to heaven, what shall we see? What will it be like? What will we be like? Well, here in John chapter 14, Jesus himself begins to speak about heaven. And it's only a few hours before Jesus Christ is going to die on the cross and his disciples are very confused Jesus said I'm going to be going away uh, and I will come back and they they're very sad about that uh, he tells them that they're going to desert him and someone will deny him and they're very upset and disturbed so Jesus says in John 14 don't be worried don't let your hearts be troubled believe in God believe also in me and now he speaks about heaven. He says, what is heaven like? First of all, he says, well, I'll tell you this, my friends. It's my father's house. What is heaven? What is it like? It's very homely. It's my father's house. Now, wherever we go, we go out shopping maybe, we go on a holiday, go on a journey, uh, we were away for three months recently, myself and my wife. I retired from being the pastor of St. Mellon's Baptist Church. And we thought, well, we'll go away for a, a while. We went away for three months to Mid-Wales. And I enjoyed it. But when we came back, 
There's no place like home. Something that's familiar. Something we can relax in. And Jesus says, I'll tell you what heaven is like. It is the ultimate home. It's my Father's house. And as well as being home, uh, Jesus says, in my Father's house, this place that's very homely, there are many rooms. The translation says here, many, many rooms. So the picture is, there's one house. We're all together. God is the head of the house. And we're all in the house. Have you had Christmas? Who came to our house for Christmas? Uh, we were affected by COVID and we've got six children, 11 grandchildren. And for Christmas Day, five of the children, their children made it. And we had a, a good group there. But there's one family in Mid Wales. Uh, COVID affected them. They couldn't come. So this weekend is our second Christmas. So after the morning service, uh, I'm not staying for lunch here. I'm going back to see my son, his wife and their, their five children because they're going back later on this afternoon. And uh, yesterday we had a second Christmas day. Another family came and, uh, oh, it was, we're all together. We got quite a big house. And uh, there's me, I'm the head of the house. Well, my wife's the head of the house, really. But uh, anyway, we're, we're together. And uh, there are many rooms in the house. And there we are, we're together. And uh, heaven, God the Father. And everyone who's there will be together. But we'll have our own space as well. No barriers. It's lovely, lovely picture. One house, many rooms. But another translation puts it this way. In my father's house, where my father dwells, there are many mansions. Now, I like that. I like that translation. I don't mind a room, but I really fancy a mansion. And uh, I don't know, again, I don't know where you live. I'm sure there's some very grand houses in Clitheroe on the outskirts and Swansea and those, these areas. Maybe you're driving past, you say, ooh, I wonder who lives there. You might look in the magazines, you see these lavish homes. Somebody, I forgot who it was yesterday, I was reading, they bought a new home and it cost them $500 million. Uh, and it looked pretty nice, actually, pretty nice. But wherever you might live on planet Earth, there's nothing to compare with the mansions awaiting God's people in heaven. So this is our hope. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. What's heaven like? I'm going to try and say a little bit more, but there's a problem in speaking about heaven. It is so glorious, the Bible says, that no human words can really express it. That's the problem. There was a man in the uh, New Testament, his name was Paul. At one point he says, um, I was caught up to the third heaven. And he says, I was allowed to see things which are inexpressible, which a man is not permitted to speak about. And then he came out of his vision, he says, whether I was... It was a vision, or whether I was caught up bodily into heaven, I can't tell. But what I saw really blew my mind. And uh, he says, no human language can express it. So if Paul were here, and we said, I said, oh, now, I'm trying to talk about heaven, but there's a man here this morning, he's called Paul. He's uh, over 2,000 years old, so let, let's ask him up now. And he totters up here. And uh, Paul, you've been there. Tell us what heaven is like. Well, Paul would have a problem. Because it is inexpressible, says the Bible. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If you want to do something this afternoon, have a read through the passage where Paul says those words. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9, Paul quotes Isaiah. And he says, when it comes to heaven, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has got prepared for those who love him. And yet God has revealed something of it by his Spirit. So what's heaven like? Well, no eye has seen. What's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? All right. Me, me apart, okay? What's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? And you multiply that. No eye has ever seen what heaven is like. 
What about the sounds of heaven? What does it sound like? There's some wonderful music we can hear. I mean, I came through the punk rock era, which I said I enjoy, but really it was just a din. And then I came in my more mature 20s to enjoy classical music and Beethoven and Mozart and uh, these high levels of beautiful music. But what's the sound of heaven like? No ear has heard. Oh, well, we've got vivid imaginations and we can conceive all sorts of wonderful things, but God cuts us short. I tell you this, no mind of all the billions of minds has ever conceived what heaven really is like. Here's something else about heaven from John chapter 14, where Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself. So listen now, heaven is a place prepared for you. And God knows exactly what we need. So often in life, maybe we go on a holiday, we looked at the brochures and we get there and uh, it doesn't live up to our expectations. Someone once said, I think it was Tony Hancock, that in life, the expectation always exceeds the realisation. They expect so much. We were reminiscing yesterday as a family. Uh, I try every, I really do try every year to buy my wife a present she really wants. And year by year, I've had one or two hits, but most are miserable misses. Uh, one of the classics was I bought her something. I went into a department store and I said, I, I want a perfume that my wife will like. And being a man, she sold me an aftershave. I didn't know it was aftershave. It said Uomo, and apparently that's Italian for, for men. Well, I wrapped it up. It's in a big granite bottle. I should have had a clue there. And I gave it to her and she unwrapped it and uh, I bought her aftershave. Didn't go down too well. Another year I bought her a drone. That went back to the shop. Um, oh, countless things. This year I bought her. I thought, oh, this is, this is good. She likes music. I bought her these lovely... Bose sunglasses that uh, vibrate on your temple and connect sound uh, into your ear. It gives a wonder. I tried them on in John Lewis and they sounded really superb, but uh, they've gone back as well. And, uh, and she expects so much when she opens the presents, but she knows it's from, from me and uh, it might be a hit, it might not be. But listen now, heaven is prepared and God knows it will fit you perfectly. You won't go around heaven thinking, well, I wish she'd put the cooker here or the sink and the drawer. And that's not quite. And if we only we'd thought, then that could have been hanging there. It'll be nothing out of place. Everything will fit. With heaven, the realization far will exceed any expectation that you or I might have. Let me turn you, we come to a conclusion as to what heaven is like, to do a little passage. There's so many passages that speak about heaven, but here's, here's one, Revelation chapter 21. We're going towards the end of the Bible. And John's given a vision and he says this, Revelation 21 and verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for, or because the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, this is God speaking, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. So that's the immediate presence of God. Where is heaven? It's where God is. And God's going to draw back the curtain. Behold, ta-da! The dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with them. And they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Now listen to this. What's heaven like? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Have you ever had an occasion to shed tears of sadness. It's not going to happen in heaven. Children, there's nothing to make you sad in heaven. Older people, 
You've been through a lot. I've been through quite a bit in my 64 years. I don't know what's still to come. Will I cry again on planet Earth? I guess I will. I keep saying to my wife, I've got to go first. I've got to go first. But who knows? Maybe she'll go before me. I've been through difficult times. You're not thinking of many things. I tell you, no difficulties in heaven. No sadness is there. God wiping away all tears. And he says, and death shall be no more. You know, day by day we can hear about the COVID statistics and so many infections and so many hospitalizations and so many deaths within 28 days of a positive test. And so they go on. We've passed 150,000 deaths attributed to COVID, and the truth is probably far greater than that. But in heaven, no death statistics. Now, as well as COVID, of course, 10 times more people than that die of other causes. But in heaven, no death statistics. Death has been banished. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. Listen to this, a catch-all. For the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. So everything's going to be transformed. The former things pass away. And all things are made new. The glory of heaven. Our sure hope now i come to the final point here's a question take it now listen to this now children older people here's a question for you will you be there there is an alternative it's called hell and it's the opposite of heaven oh god is there in hell but it's in his unrestrained person and yet we're not prepared to meet him so we're like the shepherds at that first glimpse, but it gets just worse. And God's opposition to sin and wrong and error. And we can't take it. But heaven, His unrestrained presence, and we're prepared to meet Him, and it's, it's glorious. Now, will you be in heaven? Now, how do you answer that? Some say, well, I, I hope so. If you're saying, I hope so, I have to tell you, you're not yet going to be there. You've got to be able to say, I know so. It might sound arrogant, but there is a way to be sure. If you're saying, I hope so, I might ask you, what's your hope based on? Well, I'm not so bad. I try my best. I'm as good as anybody else. That's you. That's you. And that's why there's uncertainty and doubt comes in. But for the Christian, it's not based on me. It's based on Jesus, who said, I am the way, the truth. I'm just following him. I'm hanging on to his coattails. I'm not going to let him go. Actually, he's not going to let me go. He's got me on by the scruff of the neck, and he's taking me to glory. At times, I can be wayward like a silly sheep. But he comes and finds me and puts me back on the track. Sometimes I'm over his shoulders. But because it's him, it can't fail. Because of what he has done. And let's finish with this then. I'm so grateful for this man. He gets a bad press. He's often known as Doubting Thomas. But here he is in John 14. And Jesus says, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to prepare a place. I'll come back and take you there. You know the way. And Thomas says, we, haven't, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? He's honest. And if you've got doubts, be honest about it. Ask some of the church leaders here. Say, well, I, what he was talking about, I find it warming and attractive, but actually I, I don't really understand. Be honest. This is so important. It's more important than the booster. And come tomorrow night. Is it tomorrow night? Yeah. What time? Seven. Seven. Yeah, come along. Ask your questions. And uh, settle this matter. Thomas was honest. We don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? If he hadn't said that, we wouldn't have this wonderful response from Jesus where Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through 
me. I am the way. How do we get to heaven? What is the way? It's Jesus. Notice two things in closing about what Jesus says about the way. First of all, it's, it's, it's Jesus-centered. It's egocentric. It's all about him. I am the way. It's not you, says Jesus, it's me. It's not what you do, it's what I'm doing and what I have done, says Jesus. It's, it's me. So Christianity is not religion. Religion says do, Jesus says it is done. As he died, he said it is finished, it's completed, God's plan is sealed and completed, just trust in me. Religion says do, Jesus Christ says it is done. Morality says, I've done this. But Jesus Christ says, this is what I have done. So it's not about you, it's about me. Jesus says, I am the way. It's egocentric. And secondly, and some find this difficult to take in, some are even offended by this, it is exclusive. And it's only what Jesus says. I'm not lifting this up and saying, this is my idea. All I do as a preacher is I read the Bible and try and explain what it says. So Jesus says exclusivity here. Notice again, he doesn't say, I am a way. Oh, he says, so what, what is the way, says Thomas? And Jesus says, well, uh, there are many. I'm one in a long line of people who've come along. And uh, you might uh, believe in uh, Moses, or you might believe in... Uh, Krishna or you might believe in the, the Buddha or you might believe oh, there's another man coming and he'll be in uh, the Middle East his name's going to be Muhammad you might believe in in uh, in him there are many ways he doesn't say that he says I am the way the truth and the life why is Jesus Christ the only way to heaven it's because he's the only one who's dealt with our problem and the only thing that keeps us from heaven I say the only thing it's a massive thing it's called sin we have a disease of the soul called sin it starts at conception it comes from our forefather Adam and it infects every single one of us nobody's immune to it we don't see the effects initially. Well, how lovely to see a newborn baby, but they soon begin to make their demands. I'm the center of the universe. Feed me, feed me. We had some little kids yesterday. How difficult for six or seven kids to play with one toy. My turn, dad, dad, mama. Oh, the shenanigans we had going on yesterday, but their, their children, what are they doing? Expressing their self-centeredness. My turn, I, me, mine. We have to teach children to share. And as we get older, there's something of maturity comes, but still within us, there's this problem of sin, greed, avarice, more. And we think, and I don't have what they have. And then we don't consider other countries where there's abject poverty beyond our imagination. And we're in the, one of the wealthiest nations on planet Earth, so to be poor here. I'm working with the homeless in Cardiff City Centre. Well, that's pretty desperate. But it's not like being homeless in other countries. There is something, and there are those who care. There is a system that uh, they can engage with. No, sin. This is what stops us from going to heaven. Above the gates of heaven, Revelation 21, verse 27. Nothing that defiles will ever enter here. Heaven is pure. Heaven is perfect. If I go there as I am, I spoil heaven. It ceases to be pure and perfect. Why is Jesus Christ the only way? He's the only one who's dealt with sin. How does he do it? Well, a few hours after he's spoken these words, he's taken, he's nailed to a cross, and he's hung up, and he's left to die. What's he doing? He's giving his life, he says in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, as a ransom for many. The wages of sin is death. The penalty for sin, the wages, what we heard is death. Physical, spiritual, eternal. We die physically, we don't know God, and there's a hell to come. Jesus Christ says, well, I, I want, he's looking at you from eternity. 
you might not be too concerned right now, but Jesus is. He wants you in heaven. But you can't go because of sin. He knows that, so he comes and he deals with your sin. He does two things. He lives a perfect life for 33 years. He sits the entrance exam for heaven in your place. He puts your name on the paper. You're a failure. You wouldn't even get an F. You can't even spell your name right. But he puts your name on his perfect paper. He says, I'll, I'll live it for them. God becomes a man. Jesus, who is he? Second person, the one triune God. God, one being, three persons. Who is Jesus? Second person of the one triune God who becomes a man without ceasing to be God. He's the God-man. He lives a perfect life in your place. Then he dies your death. Calvary was hell on earth. Well, I don't believe in a God who sent people to hell. To stop you going there, my friend, he went there himself. He dies the death that we deserve on Calvary. Not only a physical one, it's an eternal one. He pays that debt of hell for countless millions of people because this is how much he loves you and wants you in heaven. Do you want to go there? This is what it cost. It's free to you, but it cost him a great deal. How do we know it's all true? Well, the third day he rose again from the dead. He said he would, and the Old Testament said that he, he would, and he himself said that he would. And so many saw him alive, physically, eating, drinking. They could touch him. And then he ascends back to, to heaven. He's alive. He's conquered death and hell, and the price has been paid. Jesus alone has removed the barrier. He lived for me. He died for me. He rose again to prove it's all true. Here we are 2,000 years later. What must you do to know you're going to heaven? Turn away from self, religion. I won't give tuppence for it. Morality, it will always fail. Trust in Jesus Christ. Believe on him. With belief comes repentance. You can't have one without the other. God have mercy on me, a sinner. And trust in Jesus Christ and you get the golden ticket to heaven. Yeah, he takes your sin and paid for it. He gives you his perfect life. How can I be sure I'm going to heaven? Because it doesn't depend on me. It's not how many times you've been to church. Have you been to Sunday school? Have you said enough prayers? Have you read the Bible enough times? Stand up, sit down, nod your head. Have you been on pilgrimage and done this? Have you given enough to the poor? It's Jesus. He lived. He died. I'm trusting in him. That's all that matters. Have you got it? If you haven't, get it. Make sure you get it. If you don't understand it, ask over lunch, come back tomorrow, pursue until you find, until you know, because this is for you, and God wants you there, and he's opened the door, and it's Jesus Christ.